How long can Vladimir Putin afford to continue his war in Ukraine without inflicting economic pain on his own people? To talk about this, I'm delighted to be joined today by Alexander Propopenko from the Carnegie Russia Eurasia Center. Alexandra, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure and honor. I want to take you back um, to the weeks and months before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. You were living in Moscow, working for the central bank as an advisor. Correct. Describe to me how you would have conveyed the economic situation back then. Oh, you know, it's uh, quite, it's, it's a good question and it's interesting uh, and always useful to keep in mind that before the war, Russia economy has, uh, was, was in a quite good performance uh, because of uh, it was on its recovery pace after COVID. Uh, and, um, uh, well, uh, the most risks for Russian economy was spillover effects uh, from advanced economies and probably some outbreaks of a new of a new pandemic or whatever. And then, uh, so everything was stable and looked stable. And one more very in interesting thing, because uh, well, uh, when the war started, everyone outside of Russia uh, repeatedly, and well, you you may probably remember U.S. and um, U.K. authorities repeatedly told that, that it's going to be a war. And here in Russia, we saw that, no, it's not going to be a war. It would be super crazy to, to have a war. So it's like, you know, it's like a big game or whatever. So it's a big bluff. It's not going to be a war. And I remember that a week uh, before the full-scale uh, invasion of Ukraine, I sat with uh, my former colleague uh, in one of the Moscow restaurants, and he tried, so he was a... Uh, um, he is an expert in Russia from an uh, international organization, and he tries to convince me that it's going to be the war. And I, am as an insider, try to convince him that now it's not going to be because it's crazy for the economy, it's crazy for people well-being, that uh, it will undermine the whole um, growth and development and all efforts of government to, 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 to bring the economy back to recovery pace after COVID. So, and, and yeah. And and all uh, outsiders were right, most insiders were wrong. And now we are where we are. Talk to me a little bit about that early transformation into a war economy and what that meant for your colleagues that were working at the central bank. So you left your job at that point, we should say. Your conscience wouldn't allow you to, to stay in Russia. And you've been in Germany watching events from here uh, pretty much since then. But what did those early weeks and months look like after the invasion? So... Uh, shortly after the invasion, everyone was shocked. I mean, uh, there wasn't some sort of meeting uh, before the invasion where Putin will tell his, uh, his advisors and his uh, ministers and uh, chief of central bank that he's going to invade. No, everyone was shocked. Everyone, uh, well, all people I spoke with uh, was absolutely terrified and, and feel themselves devastated. But uh, then uh, sanctions came. And uh, uh, speaking on behalf of economic bloc of Russian government and central bank, so they started to work as anti-crisis managers. The role they played uh, a couple of times before. So uh, it's very interesting. Uh, also, I figured out that recently, Russia was uh, Russia faced four major crises during the last 15 years. It's extremely often compared to uh, uh, any kind of advanced and uh, developing economies. So and. and and two of these crises were absolutely handmade. It was first in 2014, first sanctions after annexation of Crimea, and then sanctions which came after uh, the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. So, uh, so, so these people started to act as anti-crisis managers, and I can uh, uh, rem remind you that first uh, there was uh, Russian reserves blocked and uh, Russian uh, government and central bank retaliate. Then they banned uh, foreign. Uh, then they banned non-residents to withdraw liquid assets from Russia. Uh, then they try to develop some sort of uh, defense measures for Russian economy, and they actually put the economy to, into an artificial coma. So they deal less with uh, war outcomes, but they deal a lot with sanctions with pure economic impact. So uh, I think that they don't have much time for reasoning <laughs> what they are doing, why they're not 
they, 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 they had a clue what they're doing, but they didn't have t much time to reasoning why they're doing this. Yeah, because when it comes to assessing how the Russian economy is doing, there seem to be two radically opposed camps, as you write as well. There seem to be one side that are saying the country is on the brink of collapse, and then the other that are saying, oh, we've never been stronger, look at the growth rates. And actually, these Western sanctions are bowing the economy. Where do you stand amid these radically opposed viewpoints? Uh, well, the reality is uh, a little bit complicated. And in terms of sanctions, I need to say that there is a, some sort of disentanglement entanglement in uh, perception of sanctions within Russian elites and Russian uh, top bureaucrats. So they're dealing with only sanctions with its economical outcomes without, as I said, uh, keeping in mind why the sanctions were actually imposed. So if you are isolated from the war, and it's, po and it's actually possible if you're working in Moscow and dealing with only your um, part of it, and then doing, doing your part of, your, of the job, which, for instance, related with financial markets, so you're, you're dealing with transactions for instance. Uh, what's going on in Ukraine? It's going in Ukraine. You're, you, 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 you can even not be familiar with, uh, uh, with the news if you are not checking them uh, constantly. So you're dealing with some struggling because of transactions. And if you, every day you are not reminding yourself why you're, <laughs> why you're dealing with transactional problems, uh, you, you very, you're very easy and very fast you will start to forget uh, what, was the, what was the reason behind all that. So actually, uh, and I think this is a big problem with sanctions, the communicational one, which is underestimated by uh, both in Russia and here in the West. Uh, and speaking about the debate here, of course, there are two different uh, polar opinions. Uh, the reality is somewhere in the middle, since Russia's economy is a big animal, is a big and rigid animal, it's quite complicated to to, be, to, to kill with one shot. So uh, uh, with a very short term, economy is performing well. It's partly because of its, uh, its on its, it, it was on its uh, recovery growth pace. Uh, second, this growth, of course, is based uh, on uh, export revenues and on uh, high spending. The fiscal impulse uh, from Russian authorities in 2022 and 2023 exceeded 10% of GDP, uh, historical high uh, uh, in Russia's history, and uh, and uh, so all this uh, and and uh, all uh, this fulfilling uh, this uh, economic growth 3.6% in 2023. Uh, but uh, we need to always keep in mind that uh, since Russian government will stop spending or decrease spending, growth figures would be different. And uh, there is a, there we, we already see the big problem between spending and inflation. Inflation is a problem for Russian authorities. It's a problem because it will uh, it, it will mount problems uh, in the midterm and in the long term. But now, well, it seems manageable. But well, it's it's always a trade-off for policymakers. And, uh, and, the, and the, actually, the major reason of the inflation, the primary reason of the inflation is state spending. So there is a problem of right and the left hand in Russian economy. With one hand, Russian central bank trying to mitigate inflation to tam uh, price growing. And uh, with another hand, government uh, continues spending, and mostly on war. I mean, uh, Putin committed war expenses in 2024, approximately 8% of GDP. It's uh, another history record uh, since in, in in the, in, the, in the history of modern Russia since the, the state was established after the collapsing of Soviet Union. And it's enormous. I mean, never before uh, Russia spent so much. And here are extremely uh, high wages of uh, those people who are in trenches, uh, state demand on uh, weapons and ammunition, and inflation of uh, enterprises, which is much higher than the average over economy. And if Russia continue to so Putin will need to choose sooner or later uh, between three uh, major goals, between his three priorities, financing the war, uh, maintaining people's well-being, so uh, paying pensions at the same amount, keeping wages and keeping people happy with the payments and uh, lower inflation. So achieving all three goals in uh, one time, it's impossible.
You know, something you, you refer to as Putin's trilemma, isn't yes. it? Trying to balance yes. those three things at once. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit more about oil because, of course, Putin did manage to find new buyers in China, in India and Turkey, for example. But that has also led to a kind of a shift in power dynamics. And I'm particularly interested in how that relates to Russia's relationship to China. You know, Russia is very much the junior partner there. How will that play out in the future, do you think, economically? So economically, the dependency of uh, dependency of Russia on China is growing, but China, I would say, benefits this uh, kind of relationship a lot and enjoying uh, uh, and enjoying it. It is quite cheap for China. I mean, uh, for uh, Russia, it was a tiny market for Chinese producers. But after uh, the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, it's, it's uh, transformed into medium market. We see that uh, for Chinese uh, policymakers, it's quite easy to massage Putin's ego, saying that he's a great uh, man and a uh, leader of a great country, but uh, and uh, we, which brings to China cheap energy resources first and foremost. Then uh, Chinese companies of I would say second and third row since. Chinese companies of the first of the first row and Chinese banks are quite. Um, I'm trying not to get along with Russia so much, so showing that they are respecting red lines uh, mm -hmm. drawn by the West. So, uh, but 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 second uh, but uh, second row company then third row and companies and banks they're all enjoying this growing dependency. So uh, and and th th this will grow. I mean, uh, so Russia will be more dependent on China not only in terms of of, uh, having a, a buyer on uh, Russian energy resources, but also uh, in terms of technological import, uh, car making. So there are only two car uh, car makers on Russian market. Before it was the whole world compete there, and now there is only Russian Avtovaz and uh, 14 Chinese brands. I mean, it's it's huge, and it's only and this transition happens only in, uh, during two years. In, in 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 there is also a remarkable example uh, from. Um, from the region of heavy vehicles, uh, the uh the share of Chinese heavy vehicles and trucks on Russian market uh, increased, skyrocketed. It has increased on 600 uh, percent during one year. Which is mind blowing. It's blind. It is. It is. And uh, well, since uh, when Russian producers like Ural and Kamaz, uh, so they, uh, try, they they were focused on import substitution and uh, fulfilling uh, the demand from uh, from the army, from the state. Chinese uh, uh, Chinese industry just. Uh, just set the market. They occupied the market, and um, it would be quite complicated to push them out if uh, and when or when Russia will uh, think to do this. Right. So it's fair to say that Russia has found new buyers for its energy. Yes. But there are other areas where Western sanctions have been hurting the economy a little bit more, especially in the area of technology. Maybe you have a couple of examples you can share about how that's affecting the economy. Uh, so in terms of uh, technology, there is uh, Russia, you know, uh, not developing its offshore uh, gas and oil uh, because uh, there is no access to technology. Russia lost, uh, from, from, from what I heard, Russia Russia lost uh, its leadership. It, it, was, it, it wasn't a leadership, but it has a claim to be a leader in terms of AI, in terms of uh, biomedical technologies, and uh, Russia's industry struggling to get uh, hardware and uh, uh, so uh, both hardware and software. So they're switching from uh, uh, f from Western companies to Chinese vendors, and now they're feeling difficulties with payments, and also payments and transactions. All these settlements issue is also a bottleneck uh, for Russia, and this bottleneck was created by, uh, because of sanctions. Uh, there is a very interesting uh, story because there is a room for uh, interesting development between Russia and China in terms of uh, creating uh, parallel infrastructure, parallel settlement infrastructure, which uh, may be in the super long term, not where very, very we, we are decades from uh, when it started to undermine dollar dominance, which Russian uh, propaganda is trying to say. 
but it's but, 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 but Russia and China dealing a lot on this issue, uh, and, and it's also an indicator that uh, this is a pro this is a problematic area uh, created by, by by sanctions. So in terms of uh, coming back to technology, there are problems with computers, with semiconductors, uh, which uh, Russia cannot fulfill uh, itself, which Russia cannot uh, substitute domestically or from China. So uh, Russian. Um, businesses are now forced to deal with uh, not systemic solutions but with different kind of schemes with different kind of uh, third countries kind of proxies uh, which can be uh, you, which which can be easily traced and uh, banned by sanctions uh, on a, so in general it uh, limits russian productivity and we see that uh, wages are growing and inflation are growing but russian productivity is not growing at all and is there is there anger among the business community no no it's not an anger since uh, they, they, I, I, I don't, I, I don't know. I would say correct, uh, correctly to say I, I know nothing about the anger, but uh, business community. I know no one who is quite who is happy with the with the current situation. Mm -hmm. So uh, and uh, the attitude of Russian business and Russian bureaucrats, I would describe with the very you know infantile uh, formula that can we go back to February 2022 when, uh, okay, there is a geopolitical struggle with the West or how our leader understands that, but there is no war, right. which is distracting resources and uh, which is really devastating. But uh, because uh, but because of the isolation, uh, because of the design of personal sanctions and because of lots of people are in the lists with uh, bad reasoning uh, why they are here, because someone called them that they are near Putin or whatever. So the uh, anti-Western sentiment is growing in Russia, and this is, well, on the long term, I think it's bad, since once uh, this war ends and, uh, well, both countries need to think, well, Russia will not disappear and EU will not disappear. So, um, uh, so Union and Russia will need to think how they will live, uh, how we will, they will be neighbors uh, in the future. Well, and, uh, and and this anti-Western sentiment, of course, will poison uh, this future for years. And does, does that anti-Western sentiment also apply to the economic uh, policymakers and advisors that you know you used to work with? I find fascinating that people uh, that some people who were responsible for attracting foreign investors in the Russian market now are actually quite skillful uh, policymakers who are designing obstacles on the path of Western companies to withdraw their assets and to and to leave Russia. So some of these people uh, feel themselves uh, really offended and uh, they are acting in a retaliation mood. Some of them, uh, you know, they, they think that they, they are... They, they, they are like fatalists, so <laughs> they're dealing with the situation. But I think that the, 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 the here is it, it is a big problem since uh, neither one side nor another knows how to live, how to deal with each other in the future. The very, the, 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 the very uh, simple example is in terms of uh, exchanges, institutional cooperation between Russia, Russian institutions in a very wide range in science and universities and corporate world and the West. So all the is stopped and this all and, and and this looks like a double sarcophag on uh, on, on, on a Russian human capital so there is external pressure uh, the West who, do, who doesn't want to who, or um, who are not dealing with Russians anymore because they're Russians mm. and and from the inside uh, since every contact uh, should be traced uh, or uh, um, uh, people from FSB are in, uh, interested in every context in every actions and why so why you're reading uh, why you're reading for a Western article? Why are you doing this? They're questioning people. It all creates uh, the very, very bad environment. So people are, you know, stopping to be, even be interested in what's going on here. And um, very easy. And, and, and Russian science and Russian universities, very easy you will become, you know, a cut off the... Uh, uh, the, 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 um, the, the frontier, the science frontier, and uh, the, the, the most recent developments uh, in different science fields. And uh, uh, as I said, in the long run, it's uh, dramatically decrease and damages the quality of human capital in Russia. And it's, of course, disturbing. Do you think, though, on the other side, that you'll also see a deeper academic cooperation with 
the likes of China and India as a result of this? I, uh, so there are issues with the collaboration in China which are also disturbing since there are uh, multiple cases uh, when FSB accusing Russian scientists uh, in a state treason because of their collaboration with China. So I think Russian scientists are quite uh, careful in this kind of collaboration too. But um, uh, it's you, you know the so the science the language of international science is English, mm -hmm. and in Russia everything which is in an English now sounds bad, and then the, the, the level of knowledge uh, of Chinese is increasing. But we only two we, 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 we it's only two years of Russian pivots to the towards uh, east, so it's not enough to have you know to have a bunch of uh, Chinese watchers of uh, experts who are uh, who can fulfill feel the growing demand on China, same with India. There wasn't, uh, Russia, um, Russia has a very few India watchers, uh, even in a very peaceful times, uh, they couldn't uh, appear accidentally because a uh, Russian president decided to, to, to go on a war against Ukraine and, and all country were forced to do what, what, what it's doing. So on the one hand, you have this kind of a brain drain, but yes. if you look at the labor market in general, things look quite good. Unemployment is down, wages in the defense sector are up. This will end as soon as the war ends. And I'm wondering if in a kind of a twisted way, Putin actually has an economic incentive to prolong this as long as possible. This is, uh, it's, th th there is a very interesting backdrop on uh, what you're calling a good side. So unemployment, when unemployment is on this historically low level, so it's 2.8%, uh, uh, it basically means that there is no workers within the economy. So if there would be any kind of external demand opened or internal demand, so for instance, uh, China will need uh, Russian cars. Uh, and after us, we'll say, okay, we can fulfill this demand. They simply cannot find people who will assemble the cars because there is no workers. So in Russian market, is, uh, it is, it's good, probably good situation in terms of worker since uh, employers are forced to pay them more so people keep their jobs and not, uh, not leaving their jobs and go to other employers. But uh, on the back side, uh, but, 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 but there is also other side. So there are three uh, major forces on Russian markets who are competing for the labor force. It is an army itself who literally need men to put them on the trenches. And this men on the front line, uh, they're getting uh, enormous salaries. And the problem here is once the war ends, uh, there is no reason for the state to keep the salaries. And uh, this will, do, so uh, it, is, it is a big and open question to me how uh, Russian authorities will manage this problem, which is actually, I think, semi-social. So there are people who think that they are war heroes, who want to be treated as war heroes, and uh, their salaries are unbearable burden for other taxpayers' uh, both on corporates and on the individual side. So uh, it, it would be a problem. The second force who is competing for Russian, uh, for um, the second force is a uh, military industry complex, which is extended. Uh, when I'm calling, when I'm saying military industry complex, I mean not only uh, industry which produces uh, stuff for the army. I mean uh, weapons, armory, tanks, uh, guns, and so ever, and supplies, but also civil part of industry, which are now working three shifts. And they are also uh, they recruiting women on a typically men uh, professions like drivers, truck drivers, uh, heavy machinery operators, and so uh, they also using uh, teenagers labor uh, in drones assembly lines because there is no workers in Russia, and they are also competing for a labor force. And third is the rest of economy, <laughs> the civil part of economy. I mean, uh, there is a shortages. Uh, there is no sector in Russia. Uh, which doesn't feel shortages of workers right now. So the situation isn't uh, super bright and there is no migrant inflow, uh, especially after uh, Krokus terroristic attack. So migrants are not feeling this. They, they, even before Krokus, they never feel themselves safe in Russia. Uh, well, Russia is quite a nationalistic country, I need, I need to admit this. Uh, but now, uh, they, they, and, so migrants' inflow is almost stopped, and, the situ and, and, and this is a limitation on development of, uh, of the economy, which also means that uh, prices will go up, 
because because uh, enterprises cannot uh, raise the productivity and also productivity is limited by sanctions by technological sanctions so uh, the situation is okay in terms of uh, current moment in this particular moment Russian feel themselves quite rich and wealthy but uh, the, uh, but 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 its perception will change in three years or in uh, in, in the midterm I would say three years it's in the midterm, when uh, situation will change, and situation will change. So when I'm writing about uh, some time frame, uh, I usually uh, back on, uh, um, on on a time frame provided by military experts who are saying that uh, in terms of uh, so from the pure military standpoint uh, for the war for the stance of war, uh, it's the next 12, 18 months would be decisive. And because the economy and the stance of Russian economy is the function of what's going on at the front line, if Putin uh, will decide to accelerate and to, to escalate and, uh, to, and if Russia wants to have another offensive, it would be some extra expenditures from, uh, from the budget and some extra pressure and tightness on the system. So the, the equation would be different. So. Uh, for uh, for if we are talking about from 12 to 18 months time frame, uh, with the current uh, conditions, so the situation would be relatively the same as it's today. Putin has enough money to uh, to continue all to, to fulfill all three his goals. After that. Uh, he will face uh, budget burden, budget problems because of inflation. You know, you mentioned earlier that Putin is spending 8% of GDP on defense. I think about a third of this year's budget is, is going in that direction. That is, of course, at the expense of other areas like social spending, health care, education. Are Russian people feeling the effects of that sort of prioritization already? So uh, social spending is not cut. And uh, it's actually accelerated. So um, there was a very interesting trend we're witnessing right now. So a very interesting, um, the changes in the people's attitude of wealth distribution since 90s and the first time ever we see this. So because of the war, because people from a low uh, income stratus are pure, to, are pure beneficiaries of this war, they feel themselves more rich and happy and, and they think that the situation with distribution of wealth within the economy is more fair than it was before. So we're in a very paradoxical situation that uh, uh, people are not feeling, uh, people lived quite badly before. Now their living conditions improved. Uh, they are not uh, thinking, uh, they, they don't have any time, or any, any kind of long time horizon. They are not planning for a long time. Uh, so uh, they're living uh, to the, they're living with today and for today they are fine. So people are noticing that their life is changing, but for but, but, but for some people life changed in a good way, so they are pretty happy with that. You've mentioned before that the longer this war continues, the worse the hangover will be. And I'm not going to ask you to try to predict when the war will end, but I am interested in your take on how Vladimir Putin will deal with a bad hangover. I think uh, that people's uh, living standards will decrease, but they will decrease uh, moderately. So we will see. Uh, so people will have uh, less money because of because of inflation. So probably the figures they will see from their SMS from banks would be relatively the same. But uh, the uh, purchasing the consumer capacity of these uh, sums will be different. Then uh, I think we will see we will witness a growing level of accidents. Uh, with machinery, with, uh, uh, with, with, with floods, with fires, with, uh, uh, with the utilities, with all this stuff because of, uh, um, because of the sanctions. So it's complicated to find particles for, uh, for, for the industry and uh, because of underfinancing the whole industry. People will see that uh, so there would be less roads built and less, less industry, less infrastructure would be built because the cost of this construction is raising because of the inflation. So I think he will choose uh, gradual uh, worsening of uh, living standards and uh, he will of course uh, 
uh, say that it's all because of the West, it's all because of the cruel West, all because of the sanctions. Uh, and, and, and this is very important what we need to um, realize about Russia. Russia is on its survival mood. So when we are looking on, its, on this with our matrix of normal business cycle, well, it's okay. And then and, and here we can say that there is no bright future in the midterm. But if they, 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 are, they are super happy and they are encouraging themselves when they, when they are when they can bypass sanctions, when they can find something new, very temporary, and they're encouraging with all this teeny tiny success. And all this means survival mode, yeah. So control of the masting might be the most powerful force there. Alexander Prokopenko, thank you so much for talking to us today. Thank you.